Um, good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks for joining me this afternoon. My name, um, in case you don't know me, is uh, Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. And uh, this is a kind of an exciting time of the year for us here in the Brooks Camp area. And we're located in the center of the park because at this time of the year, there's a lot of bears that are coming around this area. And it's a pretty fun experience um, for everybody here um, to watch these bears come back into the river area. Um, I, you may notice that somebody's missing here right now. Um, earlier I had said that um, another ranger would join me, Ranger Roy. Um, but uh, he's not here right now. Um, he's actually in King Salmon, so unfortunately he couldn't make it. Uh, and a lot of you I know have been uh, watching the bear camps kind of throughout the month of August. And uh, during the month of August, we have a big lull in our bear activity here at Brooks Camp. There's really hardly any any bears in the area. Most of the salmon really don't start to spawn, it seems like, until the middle of August, really until the late, late August and September. So right now, a lot of the bears are coming back to the Brooks River because they know this is when the salmon are, are spawning and they're dying. And as the salmon spawn and begin to die, as they weaken, they really they drift downstream and they collect in all the eddies and side channels um, around the mouth of the river. And they also drift out into the lake as well, too. So you oftentimes will see plenty of bears fishing out in the lake, which is um, kind of a fun experience. Uh, for the bears, of course, it's serious business. I mean, they need, it, uh, need to do this to survive. But for us, it's quite enjoyable um, to watch them fishing out in the lake. So the dynamics around the, the, the bears here in the Brooks River is quite different from what you see at July. There are, of course, some bears fishing here um, at the falls right now, but they're just not, you know, finding a lot of success up at Brooks Falls. Um, at, I think there's Otis is up there right now, if I check correctly. Yeah, so number 480 Otis is, is at the falls. Um, and he's one of the few bears that actually seems to find some success up there. Uh, a lot of people sometimes will inquire whether or not there's something wrong with him or anything like that. And I, I don't really think so. I think he's, he just is um, a good professor of energy economics, really. Um, when he's up at the falls, he's sitting there and he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting for fish to come to him. Um, and even if he's not catching any, he's really not expending any energy either. Uh, but most other bears don't find that to be a successful strategy. Um, he, most of the other bears are focused on the lower half of the Brooks River, again, and all those eddies and side channels where they can find um, dead and dying salmon that collect where the river really loses its energy. And I think the bear um, on the lower river cam right now, that's basically what he is, um, that's what he is doing. Um, so right now when you're, you're really looking um, at how the bears have changed their behavior from from July, you're you're seeing um, an example that illustrates, I think, pretty well their adaptability and resourcefulness. If a, a, a strategy, a food seeking strategy, isn't going to work for them, they're pretty much going to abandon that strategy um, fairly quickly. So, you know, they need to make a big profit in calories before they go into the den. So, it, you know, sitting at the falls, if that doesn't work for them then they're going to go somewhere else. And that's what we are seeing, I think, the bears doing right now. Um, before I start to answer um, some of your questions, though, and actually I forgot um, to mention that the, really the way that this is going to work is that um, you should be posting your questions at the bottom of the, um, of the Lower River Cam page. Um, and there's a moderator who will be feeding me those questions via Skype. And then I can um, answer those questions later on in the chat. So I apologize because I, I, uh, I forgot to mention that. Um, so that's the way uh, things will work here. Um, before I get into it though, like I mentioned, I, I want to talk just briefly about actually um, the organism that makes, you know, the whole sort of ecosystem function here at Katmai. Um, you know, when we're watching the cams, we, we watch the bears, but really the, the remarkable bear viewing opportunities that we have here at Brooks Camp essentially is based on the salmon. The salmon really are the, the heartbeat of many things here in the area. They're the heartbeat of the, of the history of this area, the human history. They're the heartbeat of the culture of this area, the modern day culture. 
And they're also, um, of course, the heartbeat of the ecology in this area too. Um, kind of a brief history uh, of the Brooks River area. Um, you know, I guess it really could start several thousand years ago. And that's when we have the first evidence of people um, occupying the Brooks River area about 4,600 years ago, archeologists estimate. Um, and at that time, the lake level was actually much, much higher than it is uh, today. So people probably weren't coming here originally for salmon because salmon just weren't easy to catch at that time. But once Brooks Falls emerged, once the lake levels happened to drop um, and Brooks Falls happened to emerge um, around 3,000 years ago or so, that's really when we start to see um, people in the area focusing very, very heavily um, on, on salmon. And it's continued that way essentially ever since. Uh, the salmon in this area are tied to this area's economy as well and modern day culture. A lot of native Alaskans in this area um, really revere the fish. And frankly, everyone who lives up here pretty much does because they are, are so important. Um, it's, it's great for the economy up here. Commercial fishing is a, is a giant industry in this area, billion, billion dollar industry each year in the, in the, in Bristol Bay. And also, um, the, the tourism economy is based on the salmon as well, too. I mean, a lot of people are coming to this area primarily to fish, to sport fish, really not commercial fish, but they just want to go out and they want to have fun catching things like rainbow trout, arctic char, a bunch of different species of fish. And those are very abundant and grow very large based on, um, well, the, the energy that salmon bring into this ecosystem each and every year. And we're really talking about how things are... Um, are impacted by uh, by the fish, you can look at basically how they impact the area through their energy and through their nutrients. Um, in fact, the bears here at Brooks Camp, to bring this, you know, this spiel on salmon back to bears, um, the bears at Brooks Camp and Katmai are feeding primarily on um, marine um, sources of food. So that'd be maybe clams on the coast, maybe a whale carcass once in a while, but primarily salmon. In fact, uh, some, some studies done in the past have actually shown that uh, the bears here at Katmai are gaining, or eating, I should say, over 60% of, of their food is, is actually derived from, from marine sources like salmon. You compare that to, to bears like in, in Denali National Park or Glacier National Park, maybe throughout the Canadian Rockies and going down into Yellowstone as well, um, those bears are primarily fattening up on, on berries. But here at Katmai, we definitely have... Um, very large bears that are maybe genetically predisposed to grow larger, of course, but they're, they have the ability to be larger just because they are feeding on so many fish. Um, and it's just not, of course, the bears that are feeding on the fish, but the number of, of eagles, um, ospreys, let's see, what else? Um, ravens, magpies, gulls, um, river otters. I mean, those things actually, the numbers of those uh, animals increase along the Brooks River when the salmon are here. And they're just not eating the salmon flesh either. They're also eating the salmon eggs. Um, in fact, if you really had a choice in a survival situation between eating a nice salmon filet and, well, an equal weight of salmon eggs, if you're making your choice really just based on calories, you got to take the salmon eggs. The eggs actually are, are six to seven times uh, richer in calories than an equal weight of salmon flesh, which is quite remarkable. And the animals really know that. So uh, when they're here, even the bears too, I mean, they may be licking every last egg off of its paw or off of a rock if they're catching a, a female salmon who's nice and ripe. Um, the, the rainbow trout and the Arctic char in this area too, sometimes when you catch them at this time of the year, their stomachs can be visibly distended because they're so full of salmon eggs. Um, so the salmon are impacting this area through the energy that they bring in each and every year. And they're also really impacting um, this area through the nutrients that they bring back to the ecosystems every year. Because you can think about these fish not only as um, a bundle of energy coming back and a bundle of energy for a bear or an eagle or whatever it happens to be, but you can really also think of these fish as a sack of fertilizer too. So when you have um, hundreds of thousands of fish, sometimes millions of fish coming into the, each, each of these watersheds every year, I mean, they're bringing back a, an incredible amount of really important nutrients that help to boost the productivity of this ecosystem. Um, things like nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, potassium, uh, a bunch of other things too. And just a, 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 it gives an incredible boost um, to our plant life in this area, to the plankton that's in the water too. 
And many fisheries biologists these days are actually thinking that maybe the salmon cycle is a, is a positive feedback loop. Really, without large numbers of fish coming back into this area each and every year to, um, to spawn, the ecosystem won't be productive enough to support large numbers of salmon fry uh, that live in, these, in the lakes and streams of this area so, to survive before they become smolt and run out to sea. Because those salmon fry, I mean, they, they're really, really tiny. Um, they really, even before they go out into the ocean, they weigh just a few grams. When they come back, they weigh several kilograms. So they've gained 99% or more of their body mass out in the open ocean. Um, but they need, of course, to feed in freshwater here. So when they're finding um, a lot of things in the uh, or things in the water to eat, like the plankton, those plankton are, are really feeding on the nutrients that the adult salmon provided maybe the year before. Uh, so without large numbers of fish coming back each year, you're not going to really have large numbers of salmon fry surviving um, to run back out to sea. Um, and the fact of the matter is, really, the survival of Katmai's ecosystem is really based on the abundance of these fish um, each, each and every year. Uh, they're really remarkable fish in a lot of different ways, and they transcend boundaries between, uh, I think, the ocean and the land in ways that few organisms can. And really, without salmon, no one would come to the Brooks River to fish for trophy-sized rainbow trout, and the Brooks River would not um, have supported people nearly continuously for the past, um, you know, nearly 5,000 years. Nor would anybody come to the Brooks River to really view some of the uh, largest gatherings of brown bears on Earth. Um, none of those things really would exist here without these fish. Um, so the next time you're watching a bear, um, you know, tear into a salmon up at Brooks Falls or down at the mouth of the Brooks River, take a moment and really stop and consider, you know, what the salmon bring to this place. Um, because really everything that we're enjoying about Katmai today, minus Maybe the volcanoes, you know, they're not affected by the salmon, but everything else is affected by them. So we really um, have them to, to sort of thank for the experiences that we have here um, at Katmai. Um, so I wanted to, to um, you know, cover that just briefly, um, but I know that you have a ton of questions um, as well, too. So I'm going to try to get to as many of those as possible. And if I don't get to your questions today... Um, then I will also be um, chatting in the, in the comment section um, for maybe an hour or two after uh, the video uh, chat is over. So I'll try to catch up with your questions there. And then um, likely tomorrow, um, probably in the afternoon, um, Alaska time tomorrow, I'll, I'll be in the comment section as well trying to answer your questions then. Um, so if I don't get to them now, um, don't fret. I'll, I'll do my best to uh, try to answer those at some other point in time. Um, so one question that um, we have is, uh, let me read it to you here. Have you identified the sow with two cubs? Um, and perhaps you could give us an update on what the bears have been, what bears have been sighted recently. Um, so people are interested to know about bears such as 402 and, cu and cubs as well as other bears. Yeah. Um, so a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a, a female bear here with uh, two cubs of the year, two spring cubs that were born last winter. Um, and actually, we haven't seen her in a bit. You know, she was here during August, uh, during the latter half of August, but we haven't seen her in a while. So, no, we haven't identified her. Um, you know, every one of us kind of has our suspicions, but to, to be honest with you, a lot of times I just kind of shrug my shoulders and say, you know, I don't know which one that is. The bears end up, you know, growing so much from year to year. And if that female did seem to kind of know her way around the Brooks River, um, seemed to show, you know, some levels of tolerance towards people. So maybe she had um, prior experience here at the Brooks River. Uh, it could have been a bear that I, maybe I just didn't recognize um, or could have been a bear that wasn't seen here for several years and decided to come back and maybe check things out. I'm actually a little surprised that um, we haven't seen more of her um, because the when she was here, the salmon fishing just wasn't that great uh, because most of the salmon haven't, haven't really started to spawn. So we haven't seen her in a, in a couple of weeks or so. And during our monitoring sessions where the bear activity is, you know, officially um, recorded, she hasn't been seen either. So if she doesn't happen to come back this month or in early October, then um, we won't really be able to identify her. And she'll be I guess one of those, um, you know, 2,000 other bears that are estimated to be here in the park as well. Uh, 
And one of the bears, and you're seeing it on the cans right now that's here every year, happens to be number 409. She's nicknamed Bead Nose. And she has three yearling cubs. And those cubs were born uh, two winters ago. So this is their second summer with her. And um, you, 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 she's been making an appearance almost every day. So it's great to watch those cubs, just beautiful animals. Um, some of the other bears that we have been seeing recently are some, some real big guys. You know, of course, um, the famous Ted, number 489, he's around still. And in fact, last I heard, he was sleeping somewhere near the lodge, um, so somewhere along the trails. Um, so uh, he, he may, make an, may make an appearance this afternoon. Of course, um, you know, Otis uh, fishing, not only at Brooks Falls, but down around the mouth of the river as well, too. There's um, one real monster bear uh, that you might see every once in a while, and I've seen him a few times as well. Uh, and that's number 747. Uh, he, back in, back in July, that, that bear was just gigantic. Um, and he may have weighed over, easily over 1,000 pounds back in July, and he's put on weight since that time. So if, he, if he's under 1,200 pounds, you know, it, it might be a surprise. I mean, he's a big, big boy. And the largest bear that I've seen on the river here during the past um, uh, couple weeks or so uh, more bears are showing up, it seems like, almost every day. Uh, when I was out yesterday, there were several bears that I, I didn't recognize. Um, so it's kind of an exciting time here. And it, uh, since the bears end up growing so much from when we first see them in July until now, it oftentimes takes me a little while to sort of figure out, you know, who, who I'm looking at. I really um, have to take my time and review photographs from past years to maybe understand um, and get an idea of, of who's out there. Um, one bear, of course, that was very famous last fall um, and was also, you know, kind of famous uh, uh, and uh, a popular topic of conversation um, this past July was um, number 469. And um, he's the one with the diamond-shaped patch sort of on his left shoulder, and we haven't seen him yet. Um, typically, looking back through the bear monitoring records here, that bear hasn't been... A, seen here uh, in early September. He usually comes later in September. And again, in past years, he uh, hasn't really shown a high level of tolerance for people. So many of the bears here at Brooks Camp are kind of uh, habituated to the presence of people. And habituation basically is just, you know, simply defined as getting used to something. There is a blog post on Explore Bears that um, I just put up to kind of explain a little bit of di that dynamic. Um, but 469 doesn't seem to um, show, at least in the fall and past years, show really a high level of tolerance or habituation towards people. So he tended to come later in September when we didn't see, um, or didn't have, there's not as many people around here. Um, so we'll wait and see. I mean, he's fairly recognizable, but we'll wait and see. Uh, and, and, and I'll certainly let you know if I happen to spot him because I'm kind of curious to see how he healed from that injury he was uh, suffering from back in July with that really severe limp. A um, couple other questions here. Um, somebody asked, uh, is it possible that number 410 uh, could be pregnant? And, th and 410, if you're not familiar with that bear, um, she is a gigantic bear. Uh, She's one of the larger females in the area um, and has been for a long, long time. Uh, could she be pregnant? It, it's, it's likely. Um, I couldn't say for sure, and her size doesn't necessarily indicate whether she's pregnant or not. With bears, uh, you know, they, the mating season for them is from really the late spring and very early summer. That seems to be the peak of the mating season for the bears in this area. Um, it really tapers off by the end of July. So the end of July, there could be some courting behavior going on, maybe some copulation here and there, but very little of that by the end of July. It's really late June, early July, where we happen to see um, the, the peak of the, of the courting and the mating actually going on. So if it, when a bear mates at that time of year, let's say 410, and we did observe her mating with several males. Um, they are promiscuous during the mating season. Um, so I know that I, I witnessed her actually mating um, with number 218, who's nicknamed uh, Ugly, 
God, I don't know. Sometimes he's a handsome bear. When he sheds out, he can be kind of ragged looking. So um, not necessarily a mean name. He's an, an off, oftentimes a lot of people like that bear. Um, but he, uh, she was mating with him. She was, uh, I think, mating with 856 um, or 747. I can't remember which. So she could definitely be pregnant right now. Uh, however, uh, the eggs actually, if, they're, if, if there are fertilized eggs within her, they're going, undergoing a, a state of arrested development right now. Um, and it, we, bears have really a remarkable adaptation called delayed implantation. And, and they have a lot of remarkable things about them. But I think this delayed implantation is one of the, the more remarkable adaptations that they actually have. Because really the, the growth period for um, the embryos and eventually the baby bear um, is very, very short. Um, the eggs that may be floating around inside of 410's uterus right now actually uh, won't implant in her uterus until she goes to her den. And that may be as late as uh, November. Uh, so she's going to her den in November. That's when the eggs implant in the uterus and that, that's when they happen to begin to grow. Um, and the gestation period beyond that point really is just a short period of time. Um, really from November to January or February. So just um, maybe th three months maximum is the gestation period for for a bear. And when the bear is born, it's born in the middle of the den, in the middle of the winter. And if you think about it, that's probably the perfect time for a bear cub to be born. Because when the bears are born, they only weigh about a pound. They're uh, very, very small. Their eyes are closed. They can barely move. They're essentially helpless, just like um, a human newborn. They actually will, will crawl basically um, to one of mom's nipples and they'll start nursing and they'll continue to nurse um, as long as, you know, they're in that den um, until the spring when she happens to come on out. When they come out of the den, they may weigh 12 to 15 pounds, but that's still pretty small and they're pretty vulnerable even at that, in that season. Uh, so if 410, for example, were um, to not undergo this delayed implantation and she would have mate in the spring uh, and the eggs implanted in the uterus immediately. And then all of a sudden in um, November, um, you know, she was ready to have uh, cubs. That would be a, a, a terrible time of the year because the cubs couldn't migrate with her to her den. Um, maybe she would still be concentrating on trying to gain enough body fat to survive the winter. So I would say that, yeah, maybe 410 is pregnant, but we might not know that either um, until next year. So um, keep an eye out for her um, next, um, next June when she happens to come back. Maybe she'll have cubs. Maybe, maybe not, though. A lot of the bears here at Brooks Camp seem to need maybe several years in between litters because it's so energetically taxing for um, these females to, to rear offspring. Um, so we'll see what happens with her. And then another question here. Um, could you tell us uh, about 409's yearlings? What sex goes with what size? Small, medium, and large. Well, we do know that there are, um, with 409 and her cubs, and again, they were just on the cam. It doesn't, um, let me see here. It doesn't look like they're on the cams anymore. Um, but with 409 and cubs, we know that um, the smallest the, of the, the cubs in that litter is a female. Um, and when we're looking to determine the, the sex of cubs, you really can't see genitalia. You can't see the important parts that would, um, you know, be able to tell you whether or not it's a boy or a girl. So you really just have to watch carefully for them to pee. Females pee out behind them. Males basically just pee straight down between their hind legs. Um, and rangers over the past week were able to see enough peeing from the cubs to determine that the smallest one is a female and the two um, larger ones, one is a female and one is a male, but I, I don't really know which one is which. I, I think I remember hearing that the biggest one actually is uh, a female, but I'm not positive on that. Um, so continue watching. Maybe you'll be able to make that observation on your own too. Um, so if they're out of the water, they're fairly close to the cams, you get a really good look at them. Watch carefully to see them to pee, and that's probably the best best way to tell the sex um, in between. And um looks like we have um, some questions about hibernation. Uh, when did the bears den, 
and go into hibernation. Um, so let me start with that one, and we have a few others. Um, there's uh, questions related to that as well. So the bears in Katmai generally um, really go to their dens uh, around around November. Um, the peak of the bear activity on the Brooks River uh, for the fall months really is about the end of September, early October. By the end of October, there's not a lot of bears here. By you know the in, during the first couple weeks of November, really hardly any bears here. Most of them have basically migrated to their denning sites. And when you're watching the cams too, uh, the, if you get a glimpse of some of the surrounding mountains, that's where the bears are going to their dens. There were some radio uh, collaring studies done on the Brooks River in the 1970s. And when they radio collared bears, they, they um, tranquilized them here in the river in the fall, in September and October, and they tracked them to their dens. And they found that they went to the mountains in the um, surrounding the Brooks Camp area. So Dumpling Mountain, for instance, Mount Katolinat, um, Mount Lagorce, Mount Kales, and they went up in elevation probably to about an average elevation of about 1,300 feet or so. Um, it's suspected that they go up in elevation to get to a place where there's a more reliable snowpack. Of course, we don't really know for sure why they're going up to that elevation, but um, we do oftentimes have you know some warm temperatures even in the middle of winter. Um, if we get a storm, a big storm coming off of the Pacific, that can be, bring temperatures to the Katmai region at, you know, the elevation that the Brooks River is in right now, um, and that's about 60 feet above sea level. We can have rain here in the middle of January, and then you can have a front move out of the Arctic, and we can have temperatures that are 20, 30 below zero. Uh, so it can be quite cold quite quickly. So if you're a bear that dens at a low elevation, and you choose a poor denning site that maybe doesn't collect a lot of snow, then you're going to be subjected to those really wild fluctuations of temperatures. But if you go higher up in elevation, you get a more reliable snowpack that may help to insulate you just a bit more from um, winter wintertime cold because um, you don't want to, of course, be exposed to that if you don't happen uh, if you don't have it or if you have an, another choice. So November is when most of the bears go to their dens, and you know part of that. Uh, another question related to that is, is that is there a, a typical pattern when bears start their hibernation? And here at Katmai, with those denning studies, yeah, we have found that there does seem to be a pattern. Um, females with um, with cubs and pregnant females typically go to the dens earlier um, than other classes of bears. So females with newborn cubs, spring cubs, tend to go to the den earlier. Um, than other bears, and so do um, pregnant females. Then, um, as you know, maybe November progresses. For instance, subadult bears, single single females, um, and then adult males will go into their dens. Uh, and in fact, uh, adult males actually have the shortest denning period of any any class of, of brown bear. So, the some adult males, if they're finding a lot of food. Um, and they may hang around um, the Brooks River till December, for instance, or even um, other salmon streams in the region. Because when a bear goes to its den, it's not avoiding the cold. Again, they want to um, pick a good denning spot where they're insulated from the cold because you expend less energy in the den uh, if you're not as cold. But they're massive, massive animals, a lot of body fat, um, really well insulated. They have a very um, low uh, surface area to volume ratio so they don't cool down nearly as fast as a, a person would or let's say a shrew or a ground squirrel whatever it happens to be so, you know that's why they can sit in the water um, and not for all day and really not get cold so they're not avoiding necessarily the cold when they go into hibernation um, they're going uh, up to their dens to avoid famine Hiber um, and hi their hibernation process is really um, the best strategy they have to avoid famine because there's really just not enough for them to eat in the wintertime to stay active. In areas where there's more temperate um, climbs uh, and maybe more food available year-round, like black bears in Louisiana, for instance, or uh, Florida, a lot of them, um, especially maybe males, they may not den in the wintertime because they can find enough food. Um, but up here at Katmai, you know, the bears... They need to go to their dens to avoid that wintertime famine. And really, they, as soon as they go into the den, they begin, they begin hibernating. Uh, their metabolism um, 
and their sort of uh, circadian rhythms really starts to sort of slow down starting in November and in October as well for, for some of the bears. So they'll spend more time sleeping, maybe less time feeding. Um, they'll go to their denning sites and, um, and really their hibernation process starts, I think as far as I know, as soon as they end up going um, into the den. Um, and how do bears, another question related to that is how do bears um, choose their dens? Well, you know, I think they probably choose their dens based on prior experience. Um, you know, maybe mom, for instance, um, is showing them when they're a cub where the best denning sites happen to be. Uh, the bears here at Katmai are not known to use uh, tree cavities. You know, as you can see watching the cams, the trees just aren't big enough to contain a brown bear. Um, black bears in other parts of North America, and I think like in, especially in the Smoky Mountains in the Southern Appalachians, um, at least um, sort of one abstract I read of, of a study down there found that many of the black bears actually went into tree cavities to den. But here that's not the case. And they're not known to use, um, you know, caves here or rock crevices. What they're probably doing to den uh, or where they're or to, to make a den is they're excavating it out of the hillside. Um, and I probably should uh, post um, after the chat the link of a video I made of myself actually crawling into a bear den back back in June. And there aren't any bears in the dens at that time of the year. And that's why I wait until late June. I don't do it at the beginning of June because there could still maybe be some females with cubs near their dens or even inside of their dens in late June. That would be pretty rare, but I try to avoid, avoid that time of the year. Um, so they excavate their dens here at Katmai. They go uh, back into the hillside um, and the one that I um, investigated. It went back into the hillside, maybe four feet or five feet. Um, and it had a chamber that was sort of just big enough for the bear to turn around in. Um, and they choose fairly steep slopes, it seems like. The bear dens that I have seen are, are pretty consistently on very, very steep slopes. Um, so that's, I think, kind of, kind of the way that they're choosing the dens. They're looking for maybe the uh, steep slopes where they can easily just kind of dig into the sides um, of them. And it's also probably based on a prior experience they had with, uh, with their mother as a cub finding good denning sites. Um, and what would happen to a bear if it is disturbed in the middle of hibernation? Uh, well, interestingly enough, um, bears can actually be aroused out of their, their hibernative state fairly quickly. Uh, unlike a ground squirrel, for instance, um, a ground squirrel when it's inside of its den, its body temperature lowers to maybe about um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, just a few degrees um, Celsius. So they have a really suppressed uh, body temperature. However, bears actually, their body temperature doesn't really drop much below normal. Um, maybe um, 10, 12 degrees Fahrenheit or so um, from their normal, um, you know, active body temperature. And I think that's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, their body temperature probably only drops to about 88 degrees um, uh, Fahrenheit or so. So they can be aroused fairly quickly. Their um, heartbeat is, is definitely really suppressed. I mean, maybe only a few heartbeats per minute, a few breaths per minute. Um, so those things are definitely suppressed, but their metabolism stays fairly high. They need to... Um, burn probably about 4,000 calories or more each each day in the den. So their metabolism stays fairly high and they can they can be aroused fairly quickly. Um, so they can, you know, if you're maybe if you were approaching a bear den and the snowpack is thin and you were, I don't know, making a lot of noise and the bear probably would be aware of your presence pretty quickly. I think bears in some areas that choose a, a denning site close to a lot of people, um, in some cases they may abandon that den um, and try to find a new spot if they're getting disturbed too much. Of course, in Katmai, that they don't really have to worry about that. That de can depend on the bear too. I think there's been um, some, even some documented cases of black bears. And we, uh, I should reiterate, we don't have any black bears um, in, in Katmai uh, on a regular basis. One in the past was seen, just one in 2005. Um, but uh, there's been some documented cases of black bears actually denning underneath people's porches or homes or something something like that. So if a bear is really tolerant of the presence of people and doesn't mind our footsteps over them, who knows? You know, that, that might be all right for them. But most of the time, they're 
they're going to try to be in a place where they're not going to be disturbed. Um, and now let's see here. Um, next question. Um, there is a, a commotion on the board because a man was just sighted on Brooks Falls, not far from where the bears were standing um, at the corner. Perhaps um, I can talk about what action is taken if rules are broken. Example um, of that would be maybe somebody fishing in the river and being too close to the bears. So, so here at Katmai, um, we really do um, ask people to maintain a minimum of 50 yards in between yourself and a bear. Um, and 50 yards is not that big of a difference. If you were watching, um, you know, a, a football game, you know, 50 yards looks like it's, it's really far. It's really not. Um, a, bear, a brown bear can cover that distance in just a matter of seconds, and they can sprint just as fast as a racehorse, well over, um, you know, 30 miles an hour. Um, so they can outrun any person. Um, and the bears here at Brooks Camp especially are much more likely to go about their business if we are more than 50 yards away. Um, they're much less likely to be defensive around us, and they're much less likely also to be curious about our movements. Sometimes if you're close to a bear and you start to move away, um, sometimes that bear is, you know, it just gets kind of curious about what, what you're doing. And you'll see sometimes their ears sort of perk up and look at, and they'll look at you and they'll say, hey, what are you doing? And they may try to follow you for a little bit. But if you're more than 50 yards away, they're much less likely to actually do that. Um, with, um, you know, if somebody was fishing too close to a bear, um, and, and anglers, you know, you see on the camera, they get surprised by bears quite a bit. Um, but if they are fishing too close to a bear and they're prohibited from having any lures in the water, if a bear is within 50 yards of them, um, then they could be ticketed. They could be given a citation, for instance. Um, so we do have law enforcement rangers here at Brooks Camp, and they, uh, they do patrol the river. Um, everyone who comes to Brooks Camp is informed about the rules and the special situations that we have here. Uh, of course, you know, the rangers aren't around 24 hours a day, and we can't communicate with everybody. Um, and many of the bears here, granted, they, they tend to go about their business, even though people are fairly close. But we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're giving the bears enough space to go about their business without us disturbing them. And, of course, we want to remain safe um, at the same time. So, you know, with certain things, um, you know, in a lot of cases, all we have to do is um, maybe talk to that person, have a conversation with them, say, hey, what you were doing um, wasn't a good idea for these reasons, depending on the, the unique situation. Um, a lot of times fishermen, they don't want to push the boundaries in most cases. Most anglers, they don't want to do that at all. Um, because if a bear is, you know, close to you, you're fishing, you're, you're having a good old time, um, and even if a bear is, you know, 75 yards away or so, you get a fish on the line, that fish starts splashing around, um, and the bears know that that's food. The sound of a splashing fish is food to a bear. So they, sometimes the bears will, you know, run towards that splashing fish and, of course, get very, very close to the angler in the water. So a lot of, a lot of fishermen know that, and when they see a bear approaching, they'll reel their lines in, of course, take their lure out of the water like they're required, but they may stop fishing well before a bear is too close. And, of course, they often do that, too, just because they don't want to lose their tackle either. Those flies are expensive, and especially your hand well buy them at the lodge here they can be kind of expensive and you know if you're hand tying them too you don't want to lose them um, either so it's um, to your own advantage of course to pull your lures out of the water um, well before a bear is close um, but you know it, bear, people do get surprised by bears all the time um, and when that happens you know we, we do ask people to make their best judgments oftentimes at Brooks camp what you need to do is just sort of walk away from the bear um, the bears here are very used to people sort of just moving out of their pathway. Um, and the bears here really, unlike some areas, the bears here aren't looking necessarily to push people out of the way. They just sort of expect us to move so they can go about their business. Um, in other situations, if a bear does happen to surprise you and the bear is acting, or you surprise a bear and the bear is acting defensive, then in a lot of cases, you should consider standing your ground. And I don't want to really get into a lot of the nuances of that um, because we could spend hours and hours and hours talking about, you know, how to behave around bears if, if they are defensive around you. 
Um, but really, uh, here at Brooks Camp, unless you are um, getting charged by a bear, in almost all situations, almost, um, moving away from the bear is, is generally the best choice. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess, if, you know, again, a, kind of a long answer, but yeah, um, if the rules are broken here, then, um, you know, they, they, people could be, um, you know, cited um, and, you know, and be fined um, for, for breaking the rules here. So um, kind of a, a related question to that um, is, um, you know, with the topic that we were just talking about, is, is that really ever a problem, you know, having um, anglers um, close to bears? And, well, frankly, yes. Um, you know, sometimes it can be. Uh, I, sh I probably should, you know, give everybody uh, a little bit of a, a, a brief history of sort of like the, the Brooks River um, and in tourism. Uh, so to make a long, long story short, and this can, I think that something, having some of this background information can, not, and can help you understand a little bit of the dynamic um, that we have here today. Um, Katmai National Monument, before this place was a park, Katmai National Monument was established in 1918 to protect the volcanic landscape around the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. And um, in the, the 1920s, a lot of people um, who originally proposed uh, protecting Katmai as a national monument thought that this area also should be protected and the monument should be expanded um, to include um, some sort of, uh, you know, some, some of the areas around here for brown bears and other wildlife. Um, there was much debate amongst um, people within the National Park Service, people within the Department of the Interior, and some conservation organizations as well. Um, there was there was talk of creating a um, a monument for brown bears in Alaska. They actually talked about maybe creating a monument um, for brown bears on Admiralty Island in south southeast Alaska. But eventually, it was decided that it would be easier to enlarge Katmai National Monument than it would be uh, to, to make a new national monument somewhere else. So in 1931, Herbert Hoover signed a presidential proclamation that expanded Katmai National Monument to include um, many, area, uh, many areas surrounding the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, and it was expanded to include the Brooks River area. And in that presidential proclamation, it specifically cited the reason for this expansion was to protect habitat for moose, brown bears, and other wildlife. But at the time, nobody was coming to visit Katmai. Um, in fact, many of the local residents in this area didn't even know that Katmai National Monument had, had been expanded in the early 1930s. So they were sort of just going about their business thinking that they could use the land like they had in the past um, because no one, had, no one had frankly told them, no one had consulted them um, on the expansion of the monument. Um, so there's very little tourism in this area. It was very, very remote. In the 1940s, though, um, people started to really discover um, a lot of the sport fishing opportunities in and around um, Katmai National Monument. Um, the, in King Salmon, actually, was, uh, the town of King Salmon, where the current park headquarters is, was um, originally established as a, uh, an Air Force base. Um, so there were a lot of um, Air Force personnel stationed in King Salmon, and you know, of course, they wanted something to do on their on their off time. So um, a lot of uh, people um, started to fly, you know, some of those um, some of those military personnel around the Katmai region, and they found just these fantastic sport fishing opportunities. Again, getting those trophy sized rainbow trout, and I'm not exaggerating when some of the rainbow trout here are three feet long, or you know, over 30 inches, I should say over 30 inches long. So they could get really, really big and people wanted to come and they wanted to catch them. Um, and one person in particular had sort of an epiphany um, in the late 1940s. Um, a man by the name of Ray Peterson wrote the Department of Interior and asked for a um, permission to start a concession, a fly-in fishing lodge within Katmai National Monument. And one of the places he wanted to establish this uh, sport fishing lodge was at Brooks Camp. So he ended up um, getting permission from the Department of Interior to establish this. And the Park Service at the time thought, yeah, this is fantastic. 
because we can actually have people coming and visiting the monument and enjoying it. Um, so 1950 was the first um, year that Brooks Camp was open, and it was primarily a sport fishing destination. Um, and it's still an important sport fishing destination for a lot of people right now. But um, starting really in the 1970s and especially in the 1980s, the audience um, or the, the visitor um, visitors coming to Brooks Camp, they were not necessarily focused as much on fishing as they were on bear watching. The bear numbers really in the 1970s and especially in the 1980s and early 1990s increased dramatically along the Brooks River. Um, so people started to come here primarily to fi um, to not not fish, but primarily to watch um, bears. And that's kind of what we have here today. We do have a lot of people still coming to fish, and that's the second most popular activity in Katmai National Park today. But the most popular activity today certainly is bear watching. Um, so when you know when people are fishing in the Brooks River, I mean it it can sometimes present a user conflict, but it is. Um, definitely um, a very important um, activity for many, many people still today. Um, and, there, and many people are still coming here primarily um, to fish for salmon. And it's certainly tied to the history of Brooks Lodge, Grosvenor Lodge, Kulik Lodge, um, and dozens and dozens of others um, throughout the area. So, you know, when, you, when we are talking about, you know, the numbers of, of people fishing the river, um, it's not necessarily a problem, you know, if people are, you know, respecting the bears, I think, um, and giving them space. Um, so, I mean, that's what we're really trying to emphasize. It's not necessarily to fear the bears here at Brooks Camp, but to make sure that they have enough space to go about their business, to get the food that they happen to need to survive. Um, and if we respect the bears and we give them space, I think everybody here can really have an enjoyable and unique experience. Um, so that I think that background information is kind of key to knowing how we you know how we got to the point that we um, of our got to the point of of how people use Brooks Camp today. Um, and to maybe move on from that topic, another question here, um, and maybe before I get to that, I should actually stop in case you join the chat late and and reintroduce myself and. And um, again, my name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger here at Brooks Camp and Katmai National Park. Um, so we'll try to do these chats every once in a while. We'll try to do several more um, during the month of September. And I'll also, I am, I am also commenting quite frequently in the comments section where you can post your questions now. Um, so moving on, uh, let's see here. Uh, Humans, uh, and this question is about humans recognizing individual bears. Um, do bears uh, recognize you after seeing you year after year at Brooks Camp? Yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, we recognize a lot of the bears from year to year. They come back each and every year. We get to know them pretty darn well. Um, so, do bears recognize us from year to year? Uh, and I'd say it's, it's probably quite likely. Um, especially some of the, uh, some of the bears that frequent maybe the buildings around Brooks Camp, um, you know, they can maybe get to know our bear technicians here, whose job is to try to keep them away from the buildings. Uh, we, we try to really, um, teach the bears to stay away from, from the buildings, um, because we don't want them, of course, to be close to people near the buildings. Um, we also don't want them to, um, start to damage anything. Um, and bears that are frequently close to people have more opportunities to maybe become food conditioned. If someone makes a mistake and leaves food outside, which they're not allowed to do here, um, or if they happen to leave maybe just a backpack on the ground. That's happened in the past where a bear has found a, ba a backpack and thought it was a fun thing to play with. So the bear technicians here will try to um, discourage bears from staying away from the buildings and I'm sure some of the bears have had enough experience with some of those bear technicians that they want to stay away. Um, there are other, um, there, you know, or I should say there are, uh, the bears are, are just so smart that they probably learn to recognize uniforms um, pretty well too. Maybe not necessarily individual people, but definitely uniforms, patrol vehicles in other national parks too. Um, in certain parks where bears are hazed, maybe um, by park rangers, and you know when they're driving up in their in their in their patrol truck, um, some bears have learned to recognize, hey, these people might be you know 
um, they might be shooting me with a, a beanbag soon enough. So I see that patrol truck coming and I'm going to leave the area. So they're definitely pretty smart animals and they pro I, I'm sure some of them probably do recognize us from year to year, especially um, bears that frequently use the Brooks River area. Uh, but I don't necessarily interact with some bears um, closely that often, like some of the bear technicians. So number 409 Bead Nose, for example, with her three yearling cubs, I don't know if she'd actually recognize me, me personally. You know, I see her a lot, but I'm not necessarily, you know, um, up close to her trying to, um, you know, discourage her from coming um, near the camp. So um, I'm more often telling, you know, I'm better at dealing with people than I am with bears. Although sometimes bears, to tell you the truth, are a little easier to reason with <laughs> than people sometimes. Um, so let's see, another question, and this one is about 409 and cubs, bead nose. Um, so will she nurse them through the winter, and will they be on their own um, next spring and summer? So, you know, we really don't know if they're going to nurse throughout the winter. Um, I suspect... Um, that since they're, you know, through almost through their second summer right now and they're so big that they're probably not going to be nursing um, in the den. I don't know that for sure. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to, you know, look through the literature, um, any published literature on bears and peer reviewed journals to see if anybody has actually documented that. Um, but I, I think... I think Ranger Gene actually did find something earlier that um, suggested that black bears may um, may nurse their cubs when they're um, when they're denning with their cubs in their second winter. But I'm not I haven't come across anything like that for brown bears. Those cubs actually, uh, you know, I was looking at them when I was on the viewing platform not too long ago, um, and I bet the bigger cubs are weighing around 100 pounds or so. So for me, I'm just I'm just trying to think about how 409 how she would be able to um, feed her offspring when they're that big. Um, they're still nursing now from time to time, but they're primarily getting most of their food from, uh, from, from the salmon that they're catching. So I really suspect that I'd be surprised actually if they're nursing in the den. But again, I don't know that for sure. And will they be on their own next summer? Quite likely. Um, 409, she's had um, two previous litters. And she weaned those cubs after two summers. So she'll take them to the den and they'll den together as a family one more time. But if she's following her patterns like she did in years past, then yeah, I bet those cubs are going to be on their own um, next summer. And from her most recent litter, there's one a, um, young adult female running around right now. Um, and she was a spring cub in 2007. Now she's a, a young adult bear. She's number 130. Um, she's nicknamed uh, Tundra. She has kind of a distinctive scar above her, uh, her left eye. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, she was on her own as a two and a half year old cub, really kind of a small one, but yeah, sometimes that, that does happen. Bears here at Katmai typically keep their cubs for two or three summers before going to the den one more time as a family and then pushing them away. It's really rare for a bear to keep their cubs through a fourth summer here, but I have seen that, um, with one bear here at Brooks camp. Um, but most of the time they're kicking them out, um, you know, before that. And uh, let's see, will the cubs keep, um, and this is related to um, bead nose and cubs still. Um, so will those yearling cubs keep um, their mocha colored fur or does it shed out and become back, you know, darker and lighter? Um, with bears, generally, they will keep their fur. Um, well, I... So let me let me back up and, and start over here. So bears tend to have lighter colored fur younger when they're younger than when they are older, especially adult males. Adult males tend to seem to they seem to darken in not all cases, but in many cases as they age. It seems like when they're a mature adult, that's when they tend to be the darkest. So I wouldn't expect a bear like 747 to get any darker because he's really dark right now. Um, some of the other adult males like Otis, I mean he's He's kind of an older adult male. We estimate he's in his late teens, maybe around 20, something like that. Um, so he's probably not going to get any darker than he is um, right now. But oftentimes, sub-adult bears, they do tend to darken as they age. Um, so when they're a mature bear, they're probably going to be darker than they are when they are yearling cubs. If, they, if those bears from that litter right now, those yearlings come back as two-and-a-half-year-olds next year, 
And we may not be able to recognize them. We could maybe guess, but we may, probably won't know for sure if it's the same bears, but they're probably going to be pretty blonde in color um, because the, it seems like the coats of a lot of bears, they tend to bleach out um, in the springtime. Um, they come out of their dens. They, they actually do look much lighter than they do when they go into their dens. Um, so it's likely that they're going to be pretty blonde um, next, uh, next spring and summer if we do happen to see them. Um, and another, you know, one, maybe one final question here about 409 and her litter. Um, if the cubs do come back on their own, how will we recognize them? We may not. Um, to, to be honest with you, uh, so, uh, with, with younger bears, it can be really difficult to differentiate them um, from, from one another and if they come back from year to year. And those cubs have a pretty distinctive coat color, so if they do keep that, that would probably be one, re one reason why, uh, or one, one way that we could actually recognize them. But it's probably going to be pretty hard overall. Um, we could do it based on their size. Um, you know, a two-and-a-half-year-old bear definitely is pretty small uh, compared to, uh, you know, some of, an older sub-adult or certainly an adult bear. So size is an indicator. Um, but to tell you the truth, unless they have, you know, a distinctive scar like, um, like Tundra had above her eye, um, it can be pretty difficult. Um, another bear that we were able to recognize um, from a cub into... Um, into adulthood, and we haven't seen him yet this fall. He's number 89, back, and he's nicknamed Backpack. We were able to recognize him because he was very, very blonde as a cub, and he's darkened somewhat as he's grown into young adulthood. Um, but we were able to sort of follow him based on his facial features. He had a pretty distinctive face as a cub, and we were able to sort of see that as well. Um, so I think we're going to be able to um, use a lot of those physical characteristics as well to try to track these bears from year to year can be difficult. They may come back. They may not. Um, especially subadult males, they tend to disperse a lot more than uh, subadult females. So subadult females, they tend to have smaller home ranges and they tend to disperse less than subadult males. So it's quite likely that, you know, maybe the male of that litter, he may not be back. He could be, um, but he may decide, hey, I'm going to wander a long way away. He's going to get itchy feet, kind of like I did. Um, when I was a teenager, um, and I and I left home to the chagrin of, of my parents, um, they'd still like me to live in Pennsylvania, but I decided to uh, explore some other places. <laughs> so some adult males are, are quite like that in a lot of a uh, lot of ways as well. Um, so any news about uh, four six nine, which a lot of you have nicknamed Patches and his well being? Uh, we don't have any news on him. We haven't seen him yet. So we are. Uh, still looking. We're hoping um, to see him this fall because um, I'm just kind of curious to see um, how he's progressed. i um, curious to see if he's, if, he, if he's gotten thinner, if the injury's gotten worse, has it gotten better? And that's really one of the things that I find most fascinating um, about watching bears here along the Brooks River. Again, we can know them really well on an individual level and we can see how they grow from year to year, how they get bigger, how is maybe they age in their older years? They get thinner, for example. You know, number 480 Otis, he's definitely not as big as he was when I first started here several years ago. Um, so he's definitely gotten smaller over the years, and as a result, his position in the bear hierarchy, hierarchy has definitely dropped, and he's not as dominant as he once was. So with 469, yeah, we don't have any news on him, so we're still looking to see whether or not he's going to come back. Um, it's going to be... Um, sometime this month, I, you know, if we don't see him um, by the end of September, I don't know, maybe he found some other place to feed. But and there, and I should also mention, too, going back through the records, there have been some years where he hasn't been seen along the Brooks River. He was first seen as an adult male in 2001, but there were some years where he wasn't seen along the Brooks River in the fall. So if he doesn't show up, that doesn't mean that he's dead. Um, it could mean he just does decided not to come back. Maybe he found another salmon stream that had enough fish for them, for him or, or something else. Um, and we're getting close to uh, 3 o'clock. Um, and when we, I, I'd like to mention that we, when we do end the, end the chat, um, 
I again, I'll be sticking around for another hour or so. I'm going to get up. I'm going to take a, a short break to get a drink of water and everything like that. Um, but we, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be on the comment section on the chat to try to answer a, a few of your questions, as, as many as I can within the next couple of hours or so. So just wanted to remind everybody of that. And, you know, maybe I, I can take a, a few more of your questions here right now. And one, uh, one question that I have is, if a bear is badly injured or sick, do the rangers get involved or is the policy to let nature take its, take its course? Basically, the policy is to let nature take its course. You know, here at Katmai, we're not only protecting, you know, the good things about nature um, that we enjoy seeing, but we're also, you know, protecting um, some of the processes of nature that are difficult to watch. Um, so it, you, off, you may have... Um, may have to watch something on the cams that just isn't that easy to see. Maybe a, another bear, you know, getting killed, maybe a cub getting killed by a larger bear, for instance. Or, you know, we were watching um, 469 at the falls limp severely throughout the month of July. Um, so we don't intervene in instances where bears are naturally injured. Maybe only in a case where, you know, human safety is threatened. For example, if there's an injured bear that comes, you know, up into the Brooks Lodge area, near the river, it has a broken leg, and it lays down next to the lodge ports, you know, we're not going to, um, we're not going to let it lay there for days. So there would be some other management strategy, you know, thought of. So, and I don't know what that is. I, I certainly don't. That would be a question for um, some of our bear technicians and resource management staff to try to figure that out. Um, so we can go into those hypotheticals, of course, but, you know, if a bear's injured naturally, um, we're going to let nature take its course for sure. Um, and I should show you um, something that's a, sort of associated with um, with bears and how, you know, they can maybe be injured even though we don't actually see uh, their injuries. Because a lot of bears, especially older bears, um, their, their teeth sort of just rot away. They wear down, they get very large cavities, and this can certainly affect their ability to chew um, food and and then eventually, uh, of course, gain weight. So this is um, an actual brown bear skull that I have here from an adult. Um, not a particularly, I mean, it's a good-sized brown bear skull, but um, not as big as we actually get. You can see the one, I don't know if you can see it behind me over here, but that is from, <coughs> a, it's a replica skull from a much larger um, bear. Um, so a bear like 747, for instance, uh, or 856, the skull, or this, this skull probably would be closer to, to their size. But I wanted to show you this in case a question came up about bears and their injuries, uh, just because this, this skull here, you can actually look and see as big cavities in its molars. Um, and a lot of bears, especially older bears, seem to have a very difficult time chewing fish. In fact, next time you see... 480 Otis catching a fish. Uh, I want you to pay attention to which side of his mouth he actually is chewing with because he always seems to prefer one side. And I think he's missing some canine teeth on one side of his mouth too, maybe his lower jaw from what I was able to see back in July. Um, so I want you to see if he prefers chewing his fish on one side of his mouth. And if so, that could indicate that maybe some of his molars on one side or his teeth are worn down or missing or maybe he has cavities or infections or something like that. Um, and th that can certainly, um, you know, sort of be the knockout punch for bears. Um, and that's perhaps something that we don't notice. So again, I wanted to, um, to show you that one more time. Let me hold it up close to the cam, um, close to the, to the screen here where you have a, an easier time seeing it just so in case you didn't see it before and I was moving this around too much. And maybe, yeah, maybe I should wrap up here, um, with one um, final question, um, do, do I have a blog where we can keep up with you throughout the year? Um, kind of. Uh, you know, I have been writing things occasionally um, and giving those um, to explore.org to post on their Explore Bear um, blog. And in fact, there's a, an entry from me um, that just got posted um, earlier this morning. So look for that on the Explore Bear blog. You can find that at the top of your browser 
Um, top of the web page, uh, if you're, wa example, watching the Lower River Camp right now, go to the top of the page, you'll see blogs, and you can go to Explore Bear, and you'll find a post for me on there. Um, I also do hope um, to create more of a, um, a, a blog for um, Katmai's website where um, you can find postings from me more regularly. Um, so definitely look for that as well. And there is um, a few postings on Katmai's website um, from me right now, uh, but I hope to get more and more of that up um, as, as time, time allows. And certainly this winter, I'm going to try to be writing um, a lot more stuff and publishing more things so everyone can read that as well, too. Um, so the, um, I hope uh, I was able to get um, to um, a lot of your questions and answer those. Um, thanks for joining me this afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll let you know, certainly, when we have another live chat here. Uh, hopefully, Ranger Roy will join us as well. I know he really loves to do these as well. And I'd like to do one of these outside one of these days, but the, um, the weather today is kind of crummy. You probably, if you're watching on the cam, really windy, rain squalls moving through here. Uh, so I certainly can't take the computer outside and uh, do a program out, out right now. But we're hoping to do a program outside once in a while so we can see you know, what's actually going on in the river um, and talk about that uh, at the same time. So thanks for um, joining me uh, today, everybody. Um, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.